They're seeing the club too, Jess. Uh, no, his dad is. Uh, yeah. yeah, my dad is. He's an RPI. Yeah. Yeah. I'm a member of RPI. Oh, yeah. I did join last year. I don't have my phone. Are you going to get I don't know. We'll work on that one. <laughs> you guys are all set up this time. You got a GoPro. You got this one here. Yeah, I'm streaming live. You gonna have time to run your little cotton belt blur? I uh, I don't think the dedication part's gonna take long, so I think we'll I think we can you know is it a Tyler trip or what? Just Tyler. Okay. So okay, I was on both trips. So. Yeah. Now I think you I think you'll see yourself in the in the if I I'm I'm sure it's you. If I have something misled, would you let me know? <laughs> I, the folks that I that I thought I knew I I Actually, I tried to the, the second it trip we made on the way back. I was a civilian. I played, but actually that first trip down there, I was just kind of—it's like a sports car. The first time you drive it, you see if it's got any problems. Right. Well, that's, that's exactly it. down there. And you were you were working that trip. I was. Plus we were pulling yeah. logs over tender, and then we put. 15,000 gallons of water in there. We wanted to know if it had any leaks or the burns was good in it. We could. We didn't have any reason to believe it wasn't. But that's not road test. But test. So we hung that sucker all the way down and all the way back. Let me ask you this. I didn't want to ask you. Okay, but is there anything to the story I heard the other day about people who got groovy, stink crew, and down there a month or two ago, a couple months ago? Looking at it for possibly what I am like to see happening to Steve Lee used to be all the program came to our shop twice. And he came down with an age and said, You had a bull locomotive, double head, 84 foot. And we're just there with that to be in the community. Because I'm telling you, it is. And if both the engines double head and they had a shepherd special, the world would turn out to but I want to go west over it. Since all that thing is over, I got a nice three step challenge. The whistle was lousy on the other Yeah. It was bad. And people relate to a good whistle on the stand. I mean, you take nickel bait in 765. It's a whistle. You can't tell me what row was. Because it's just music. Right. We need a good sound. It's going to be on there if I ever Yeah. Jason, if you want to be somebody, you want to let them do what you want to do.
put this in the back. You didn't think to bring the clock up here? No. Message from Iron Malone.
Okay, folks, we're getting ready to uh, start back up on our afternoon portion. While we're gathering back up, I want to take the opportunity to uh, acknowledge and thank our sponsors for the event. God that's been with us since we, we started to make appearance of each one has gone out of his way to, uh, to help make this possible and uh, do a lot of things for us. And that's uh, Joint Dick Pop, the Blacklands Railroad, who is a great supporter of us uh, all along. We appreciate everything that he does to help make this event what it is and his participation in it. Uh, also, this year we have Alliance Bank. The sponsor, uh, the Silver Spike sponsor, and we really appreciate them coming on board with us and uh, helping out with the event. We have uh, three Bronze uh, Spike sponsors uh, this year. We have, uh, of course, Elaine Lynn, who you see helping out right around. She's up here at the front. She's uh, one of us to sponsor this year. She's in that. Um, we have uh, Cleus Millsap, who uh, was not able to make it here today. He's the chairman of the board of directors for the North and Central Rural Rail Transportation District that owns the railroad uh, through here. Uh, and he is, uh, again, this year's sponsor. And uh, Madeline and James Justice. Uh, Madeline Justice was the uh, former department head of mine in leadership. Uh, she has been a tremendous supporter of this event all along. When she was my department head, uh, the department did a whole lot to help promote, uh, promote the symposium. And uh, now the change department, she and her husband are still uh, very strong supporters of the, uh, of the symposium, and she wants to sponsor as well, so we have her. And uh, we also have Cypress Bank as our inspired sponsor. Uh, if you have a, a business or an individual, if you're interested in sponsoring a symposium down the road, get with me and we'll uh, try to help, uh, help make that possible. Our tax deductible goes through our university foundation. Um, so if you have any questions or interested in that, uh, let me know. We'll try to grow this and, and make it a better year. Now, this year, uh, or for the past three years, we've kind of started a tradition. We've, uh, I guess just by chance, at first we uh, lost the people who have been very important to the symposium, to the railroad in this area, and to the preservation of our history. And for the last, uh, this third year now, we have uh, felt like it was the right, proper thing to do to dedicate our symposium in the uh, honor and memory of, uh, of some of these people. So for our dedication, this year, I'd like to ask uh, Dr. Jim Conrad to come forward and give remarks for dedication. Uh, thank you. We want to honor Dr. Otha Spencer for his support of the symposium. Uh, we really lost an icon when Dr. Spencer passed away June 1st, 2012. Uh, over his 91 years, he wore many hats. Uh, during World War II, he was a um, pilot for the Army U.S. Air Corps, flying supplies over the home to the Chinese Army, and also flying weather uh, reconnaissance across the Atlantic. Uh, he operated a, a photo studio for a while, and uh, as a professor of journalism at East Texas State University, now Texas A&M University Commerce, he established one of the very best photo schools in the entire United States. Uh, he was also a great supporter of the Commerce Public Library. He had three passions in his life, his family, photography, and the history of the Cotton Belt Railroad. He was born and reared in Greenville, lived most of his life in Commerce, and so he was a first-hand observer of the Cotton Belt Railroad. He did not work on the Cotton Belt, but he had an abiding interest in the history. And he searched out 
uh, railroad workers to get their stories. He uh, went to the libraries and archives and dug out uh, historical information and uh, wrote uh, the history of the Cotton Belt in this area. It, uh, his uh, 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 articles appeared in the Commerce Journal, and then he did additional research and compiled those into a book called Lonesome Whistle. And the Commerce Public Library has copies available. So along with Ed Cooper, he is the chronicle of the history of the Cotton Belt Railroad. Uh, we uh, uh, are pleased to uh, say that some of his collection will end up in the Commerce Public Library and uh, Texas A&M University Commerce Special Collections. So his memory will be perpetuated with, with uh, those materials. I also want to uh, recognize his daughter, uh, Mary Helen Spencer, who is over here. Uh, and, uh, so we uh, are pleased that, that we can recognize such an outstanding individual. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. And thank you, Mr. President, for your coming. It's, uh, it's our honor to, to recognize his father, Mr. Mayor. He's a uh, uh, lot of gentlemen. He, uh, he did a lot of the symposium, and, uh, was part of it for several years, and uh, presented some of the work from his books uh, for our benefit. And, uh, we do this. All right. Uh, one of the things I wanted to show you, I'll just step back and pay no attention to the man behind the curtain. Um, uh, I'll step back here for a minute. One of the things I wanted to uh, to show you as we talked about the 819, uh, I shot a series of footage on one of the 819's trips to the Tyler of Pine Bluff back in uh, 1993. And uh, I compiled that into a short video clip. Something been on YouTube and you know, search for it. You can find it there also if you want to see it after today. But I want you up here to see the magnificent work of the team that restored that engine to see it. it really, as it should be seen, under steam and on mainline railroad.
apologize for the early leadership. I was not expecting the opportunity to take this meeting.
uh, you can uh, tell it was obviously shot by amateur cameraman. And, uh, that was with no image stabilization in the hands of a, a young man who was out of his mind excited to be next to the heat 19 under steam, but a little shaking on it. Hopefully, someday, maybe we'll, we'll see that side again. Uh, keep your fingers crossed, you know. The uh, next item on our agenda today is an update on the current operations of the old C branch, which is now operated uh, by Blacklands Railroad. And, uh, Wayne Bishop, the president of Blacklands, uh, is uh, kind enough to uh, come give us an update and let everybody know what's uh, what's going on on the old line and, and how things are operating. So, Wayne, if you wouldn't mind. It was a big deal. 
deal, but thank goodness uh, we lost uh, all the traffic. I mean, it's totally gone, of course. And I think our, we finished up our last park over there in uh, February, March, and there was still some flowing in and out there. Probably, I think the last May or something like that. Pretty cool for that. Probably a little bit before that. Was the last car that came in and out of there. So we hope that all, uh, eventually those horses are working. We worked closely with the Green Bull Team on Development Center and things that we hope we can get somebody back in that plant that's going to uh, use rail service and, and bring jobs back to the community there. Because as everybody knows, especially uh, right now, the jobs are just really huge. I mean, we've got a lot of jobs for a city like Green Bull for the community there. So, uh, but in any event, uh, luckily, uh, or through some hard work, my wife always says that, that uh, you know, what is it, hard work is uh, good luck is just a lot of hard work. So, uh, but we we were able to come up with some other customers uh, uh, that have kind of filled the notch of the, of the void of the rubber bank plant. Uh, obviously, it would, great, would be great to have both, of course, but uh, since uh, uh, it's went down, we've been able to replace most of that traffic with other traffic. And that's a lot of trains loading out of, out of Silver Springs. And, uh, and so we're working with uh, a lot of new people. We're just now possibly going to do some shipping and shipping with uh, the, uh, the rock plant in Greenwood, which is they call the Sucker Rock plant there, just connected to the oil fields, of course. And uh, they've never really shipped by rail before, but we're looking like we're going to maybe try to get them shipped by rail here this year, before the end of the year. So, uh, but overall, uh, we've also, of course, a lot of you know, we, we run a branch down out in Henderson, Texas, which runs from Overton to Henderson. And uh, we've been involved in the frac sand business, and everybody knows what that is, of course. And that's a lot of that, all that moves, or most of that moves by rail, uh, at least to one, to a site anyway, that goes from there to truck. So that's been a big help to us in this year. It, although it's really dropped off, the gas prices have come back, come down. Natural gas prices are down, so all of a sudden that's uh, affected our fracking business down in the industry area. Because the Gainesville Shale area there, that's mostly gas. And so, of course, the gas prices are down, a lot of wells shut down. They stopped doing a lot of fracking. And so, uh, and we were taking in, believe it or not, down there, we were taking in two at our busiest, uh, which ended about March, April, uh, probably the first of May there. But uh, we were taking in 200 car unit trains down there a week. Fracking, and now that's pretty much gone. Uh, but uh, when I say gone, it's not gone forever. I think we're working with some other customers that's going to bring back some rock, and some, uh, some more frac, uh, frac sand down in that area too. But uh, that, that's been a huge, uh, that was a huge boost for us too here at the beginning of this year. So anyway, as, as, like most businesses, you know, it ends and flows, ups and downs. But so far, I mean, uh, most of the time since I've been here. We've been lucky, lucky in the fact that most of the time, like we lost Rubbermaid, we gained another customer. We lost uh, 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 one of the shippers here in Commerce, actually. Um, US, yeah, he does brass at the time. Anyway, they, you know, over the number turned down here and everything, they consolidated in their plants, and uh, they took their manufacturing that they were doing their house. Now, they weren't big to us because they were just doing a couple cars a week, but uh, still, traffic's traffic. traffic and, but we were able again when they when they left. We had a uh, like our uh, shipper in Green will be, uh, which is scrap right now. They started shipping a lot more with us. So you know, it's kind of up and down. But if you if you look at it, like right now we're probably I think we're up carloads uh, over last year. Uh, of course, and with, and with this year we don't have the rubber band plant. So uh, again, that's been that's worked out really well for us. So but we keep it going. We are. Uh, we are to the point though where we are getting enough traffic where we we've been having one crew track track group uh, keeping the railroad going from the standpoint of installed ties and everything. But through the Delta Detex now uh, this year we were going to fly. As a matter of fact, I just talked to Nate a minute ago and telling him that we're applying for a RIP loan, which is a is a is a federal loan through the uh, FRA that uh, Shoreline's going to apply for for infrastructure development and infrastructure. Uh, uh, projects and so we have submitted a loan or an application to them and we have probably going this week or this coming week uh, to uh, upgrade the railroad all the way from so in the drive actually Winfield Kangline or Winfield there all the way to almost Ridgeway which is almost 40 miles. So uh, we hope that's going to come through. We, I mean, we hope that maybe on that project by the uh, putting ties actually by uh, first of next year maybe uh, yeah, maybe probably February maybe if everything goes according of course. Uh, so that's 
size of that of course, a few uh, scrap cards and so forth, but most everything, the plastics, we do a lot of, we do a lot of plastic. And uh, all the cars got 286. So, uh, you know, you know this is just the way it's going over that track and the way that it's uh, on those ties now that it wasn't for marginal, it's just uh, not marginal anymore, it's just tearing. So, and when we go out, we can't now, we just we used to be able to go out and right at the end, we would replace, uh, if we had a cluster of ties, we'd replace maybe one or two out of that cluster, but now we decide more that we got, we need to replace almost every one of them or uh, at least uh, uh, fix the cluster rather than attach it. Now we actually try to very much have to just put ties throughout the whole area in there. And, uh, and we've been doing that too. We have not this loan that I'm talking about. That's really, since I've been in business, that's the only loan that we've really ever applied for. Uh, we've always, of course, applied for grants, never got them. Asked the state of Texas for help, never had it, never got it. Uh, so we pretty much have run this business all through revenue. I mean, uh, from, from the very beginning. And it's, it's a hand and mouth, you have to ask my wife. It's a hand and mouth thing, and you all know that it's a, uh, uh, you make money, you spend it, you put it in your plan, you put it in the road. So uh, and that's what keeps us going. And but we, we're to the point now where we just, uh, unless a you know, huge plan was on our line or something, we have to, we're going to have to go for a loan of some sort so that we can upgrade this railroad and get it to a, our, our goal is to get to a class two railroad. So we can go stronger. And the speed is not the thing for us, of course. It's just more the safety. And we, if we can put in, uh, like the, the project we're looking at, we're spending almost, uh, what, not almost, we're spending over a half a million dollars a year to a million dollars a year just on track maintenance. And that doesn't get us very far because the tide is just are ahead of us in, in, in deterioration. So we replace we replace a spot this year, a spot right next to it next year, and on and on and on and on. So uh, we needed just a total upgrade. And uh, again, like I said, we're not really up to speed, which will help, though, of course. But uh, uh, we're really up to the safety and just the, uh, the quality of the railroad. Uh, the rail, of course, was a 112 pound rail. Not much doubt, I figured it was mostly just ties. So uh, once we get that, like I said, we'll get a good almost 40 miles of good railroad, so that will really, that should affect, also help us, help us bring in new customers and uh, 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 just affect the railroad overall, our operations, uh, operating, track maintenance, of course, the biggest thing, so we do some track maintenance uh, by probably a half a million dollars, maybe, or more, uh, if we get that up here. So if you think about it, we've been sustaining, sustaining the railroad, it's almost, almost seven miles long here, just over the revenue, just purely out of revenue that's coming from the railroad. I mean, like I said, we haven't really had a whole lot of help throughout the years we've been here. It's, it's mostly just been what we produce and what we put in the railroad and, and we've been able to make it work. Uh, so uh, we just we, we to that point now, we can't, we just, we need more. And uh, that's a good thing, I think mean, that's a growing, that's a sign of growth, obviously. So, uh, and we all know that, we all know that the oil field is, uh, Really moving a lot of areas. I think we're going to expand that down our Anderson uh, location because it's uh, it's right in the East Old East Texas oil field locations. All the pipe, all the infrastructure is there, so we will both take advantage of that here in the near future. And then up here, of course, uh, in Mount Pleasant Sulphur Springs, uh, to Greenville. Um, Greenville's growing. Uh, we've got a lot of opportunity in that area. We're doing a lot of transit, we're translating. In Sulphur Springs, I think if you go by our office there in Sulphur Springs, uh, all those cars sit there, those are all transloading cars, and we switch those cars, they empty about uh, probably four or five cars a day. So we're switching them every other day, moving in cars, you know, taking out empties, putting in loads, and it's plastic. And so it's a it's been good business for us, of course, and uh, so that's a big benefit for us. Uh, uh, but overall, like I said, we're, we're hanging in there. We're, I think it's getting better. Uh, uh, and this year, I think we'll just loan and we make that all happen. Uh, this time next year, we'll have hopefully all in place and a uh, and, uh, better railroad uh, for it. So uh, uh, overall, it's been a good, still a good story. Of that. So and I appreciate everybody's attention today and uh, help. And, I'm not sure if I do, so I'm able to just a brochure to pass out to people. Uh, so
on a daily basis and they don't want to do it, they send them to us. And we've, we've had a, a number of things like that happen. Price has been a lot one of them. So um, that's, that's been really good for us too. So anyway, uh, I really appreciate everybody's time. Appreciate everybody's time. Uh, if you have any questions, you know, feel free to stop by our office. We do have hats. I didn't want to, I didn't bring any hats today, but uh, we do have that memorabilia there at the office if you stop in there. Uh,
and uh, I was just fascinated by it. And uh, what first got me thinking that this might be a good subject for a documentary was uh, all the interest we would generate like we'd go through a town or a station. Um, you know, all the old people would always want to come up, look at the cars, and ask us about them. And even when I would tell my friends what my dad was doing, it always generated a lot of questions and interest. And so that's what first got me thinking, okay, I think this is a story worth telling. And as we got farther into it, uh, into doing the film, what I discovered was that the real heart and soul of the movie was the motor car operators themselves and the stories that they had to tell. And uh, I know we had uh, we have some here in the audience today. I know Bob King is here. Uh, Myron Malone was here last night. Um, but uh, I just thank them for letting me tag along with the video camera and uh, talk to them and uh, and be able to do this movie. So anyway, we're going to watch that now, and uh, I'll be here afterwards. If anybody has any questions for a little Q and A, uh, and hope you enjoy the film. Pacific and Southern Pacific met 
Promontory, Utah. Those lines were built with thousands, literally thousands of those little pump cars. And the pump car remained the maintenance way man's uh, primary means of transportation for about 30 or 40 years. At that time, sections, which are track segments maintained by one group of men, were short of three to six miles in length. Coming to the hand car gave those men new ability. The ability to reach out further, to carry more tools with them, and to be fresher and, and better and more able to work when they reached the work site. Sections that had been three to six miles with coming into the hand car could now be as long as 10 miles. It wasn't until the 1870s that we see the next innovation come along. George Sheffield uh, had about a five mile commute to work each day. And he would walk along a railroad track that was little used, especially at night. He got the idea of building this little small cart that he would run on the railroad and speed up his commute, things like a little easier for himself. He built the machine and he used it for a number of months until one night on his way home he found a broken brake. Well, being an honest man, George went to the nearest station and reported the incident. Instead of prosecuting George for trespass, the railroad saw the innovation as something they could use and they asked George if he could uh, build something for them, for their own people. So started a very booming business for George Sheffield. The philosophy provided one man or up to three men uh, mobility to, to get places faster. They could go up to 30 miles an hour on those little machines. The first dependable gasoline engine didn't come on the scene until about 1880. And the railroads were one of the first users of those little gasoline engines. They used them for everything, from pumping water to water towers to running some of the machines in the machine shop. It didn't take long for somebody to get the idea of putting one of those gasoline engines on one of the little uh, velocities. And in 1883, Buddha was the first to market a commercial made motor car which was nothing more than their little three-wheel velocity with one of their small gasoline engines. By 1920, sales of hand cars had virtually ended. If there was a golden age of motor car production, it would have been between 1910 and 1920. At that time, all companies came on the scene that had lived time in motor car history. Many of those companies uh, manufactured kits to convert the old hand cars to velocities, and for a while business moved. The motor cars firmly entrenched. No one wanted to pump their way to work in the morning. Everybody that uh, uh, was interested in buying an engine went shopping. Uh, kit prices came down, and they sold. They sold well, but there was a problem. The old hand cars, the old velocities, usually had plain bearings. They would not stand up to the higher speeds or the rough treatment that they now got with a gasoline engine and the longer distance that they were expected to run. They began wearing out and wearing out rapidly. Uh, railroads were no longer buying hand cars at velocities. Uh, the, the motor car was the wave of the future. Only those companies that were building full-size motor cars, complete motor cars, ready to run, were able to survive. Many of the smaller manufacturers were, were bought out by the larger ones, Fairmont, which only came on the scene about 1909, became a real mover and shaker in the motor car world. They began buying up these smaller companies. Mudge, one of the, the big names uh, from the teens, uh, was purchased in, in 1929 and uh, became a part of the Fairmont. From 1920 to about uh, the mid-1950s, Motor cars didn't change all that much. The world of uh, motor cars was dominated generally by one cylinder, two cycle engines, uh, what we would call the hit or miss or popper engine. Innovation is expensive. And if you look at the, the 30 year history there, there were so many ups and downs in the financial market that it was difficult to justify uh, research and development. The thought of being able to transport men and some vehicle on the highway to a distant point and then put that same vehicle on the rails was a very attractive idea. The highway 
aerial vehicle is an issue now. For one thing, high aerial is a trademark name coined by Paramount. They're hybrid vehicles. Uh, a vehicle is equipped with small drop down wheels that can be lowered and capture the rail and guide the truck, the vehicle, the car, the station wagon, whatever, down the railroad. The only uh, criteria being that the width of the rubber tires, which carry 99% of the weight of the vehicle, uh, have to be narrow enough to fit on the ball of the rail. Beginning about 1937, 1938, a company named Evans came out with the first commercial high rail. It was a new idea, didn't catch on quickly, and World War II definitely interrupted the, the business that they had hoped to capture. Fairmont saw the handwriting on the wall, and in 1947, they began producing a better high rail, at least a cheaper high rail, than Evans had produced. It was lighter, it was cheaper, uh, it was easier to maintain, it was easier to operate. Uh, where the Evans systems had been uh, uh, pneumatic, the Fairmont system was mechanical. 